Hey family, welcome to part one of today's episode. Yes, this journey is wild. So there's a part one and a part two. Sit back, put your seatbelts on and enjoy. Safe space, we ain't never give a reason you should hide. Compile all your questions, we're taking the quest. Join Tarsha on this journey to discover the rest of go. Welcome to the Adoption Journey Podcast. I am your host, Tarsha Smith, and welcome to another uh, journey. Before we get started, I want to remind you guys to please go to Patreon and become a supporter. All things uh, mind, body, and soul. You're going to get the Extreme Hip Hop class, fun stuff from the podcast, as well as um, plant-based recipes, all things Tarsha. But, all right. So without further ado, you know how we do here at the Adoption Journey Podcast. I have a fellow adoptee by the name of Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Hi, how are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. So I I am going to dive right in. Okay. All right. I got my wait I got my waiters on. Okay. Okay. So my very first question that I always love to ask is how old were you when you found out that you were adopted? 53. Girl, stop. (laughs) Just uh, five years ago. Just five years ago. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Yeah, my mouth is wide open Uh, uh, because I uh, wasn't ready. Okay, let me close. (laughs) Because I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. Yes, just five years ago. Um... Take you know, me all that, the way back to the beginning. Well, that that's the actual number of confirmation. I had clues all, all along the way, all through my life, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that things didn't add up. And I had asked. I had asked. I had found some documents that had led me to believe that I was adopted. And I had asked. And I was told no. That that's not what I was looking at. And, and that, uh, you know. Um, my parents are, are very um, faith-filled people, and mm-hmm. so there's a um, biblical story on how I came to be um, with my parents, and um, my mom uh, really followed televangelists, the Rex Humbards, the Jimmy Bakers, the Z- Jimmy Swaggerts, yes. all of those, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so we had went to see um, um one of the televangelists in Ann Arbor and she had always told the testimony of how she had stayed in line for over two hours waiting to speak to this pastor and her heart's desires were at that time she was not married that she wanted to get married she wanted to have a um, actually in the order she needed a car she wanted a house and she wanted a child and when she finally arrived up at that pulpit, that pastor had told her if she sowed a seed, of course, that's what the mm-hmm. pastor said, mm-hmm. if she sowed a seed, that she would have all of these things within two years. And she did. And so all through my life, that was my biblical testimony on how I came to be. Um, and my mother was 40 at that time, and my father was 46. So yes, it was divine intervention for her to have been able to have this child at 40. Um, I, I was too naive to um, not do the math and, and add it all up myself. <laughs> but yes, so that was my that was my birth story. And that was my only birth story. My mother never told me anything about pregnancies and the feelings and how they got ready and how they got prepared. Those things were never a part of my life. That was my birth story. Sharon, I wasn't ready for you to just dive on in like that. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I still haven't closed my mouth yet. I'm still yes. like, yes. So that's oh, how I came what? to be. That's the story on how I came to okay, be. Okay. So growing up, did like how were you as a kid did you feel out of place or were you just you know just a regular just living life well um in hindsight of course yes uh I I I mean in 
if you if you ask me my life story, I had an amazing life. Um, mm-hmm. My parents were were business owners. They owned more than one business. Um, they were, you know, uh, we weren't wealthy by any means, but. In a child's eyes, we weren't struggling. Look, you know, I didn't know the struggles that my parents had to do to make the house payment and all those things. So in my child's eye, we weren't struggling. Mm-hmm. I went to um, Catholic school. I'd always gone to a private school. Um, we lived in a subdivision that had a golf course and tennis courts. And I always went to camps and boarding schools. And we had timeshares. So I grew up not the average little black girl who was born in Detroit. Right. And far from the life that my cousins were living. Mm. Um, so that was always very obvious to me as well, that we were so far removed from the lives that my parents grew up with. And so even though, you know, we had uh, s- some financial means, you know, most most families, close knit families don't stray that far apart. So all of my all of my first cousins were old enough to be my aunts and uncles. And so I looked at them as aunties and, Mm -hmm. you know, so going to Detroit and visiting them and everything, uh, I was, my brother and I were always labeled as the spoiled grandchildren, the grandchildren that got everything. So although we were very well loved and we were kind of carried around like the baby dolls for all of our first cousins, because we were so much younger than our first cousins, Mm -hmm. it was, always a separation that was clear in the way that they talked about us or the way that they labeled us or or associated with us so we knew we're different right. we're, we're a little bit different we live in a different place we're in a different culture we go to a different school we're in a different community um so that was always that was always known that was always a given um the relationship with my parents, the relationship with my father was amazing from the very first memory to the, to the day he died. Mm. My father was a fairy tale father. I, I, there's nothing, there is no television dad that topped my father. And when I say my dad was the type that bought me a little fur coat and said if no man ever buys you a fur coat daddy bought you a fur coat that's right daddy was the one that would bring me a dozen roses when he would bring mom a dozen roses daddy never left the house without saying i love you daddy labeled everything he bought this is for you this is for your brother this is for my son-in-law this is for my grandchild because everything i have i'm getting it for you so the relationship with my father was absolutely amazing. And I was very much a daddy's girl. Aww. The relationship with my mother, I've always felt like she was always mad at me hmm. that daddy loved me or that I loved daddy. So okay, let me ask you a quick question. Um, you mentioned your brother. Was he also adopted? Yes, I did find out that my brother was also adopted. At, okay. at, the, at the same time, I found out I was adopted. I found adopted. out that both of us were adopted and neither of us knew. And neither one of you knew. Correct. And so I wonder, you, you felt like your mom was mad at you because your dad Oh, well, she was, you, you know, like, she would always say things. She would, she would make little comments like, you know, if your daddy only knew the real you. Oh, you got your daddy wrapped around your finger. If he only knew what you were capable of. Muscle you know, girls do. Daddy's so, girl. yeah, <laughs> so for a lot, in a lot of ways, I felt like mom was such a Jekyll and Hyde. She was one way in front of daddy, very loving, very doting, very loving and doting out in the community. My mom was the PTA mom, the Girl Scout mom, the Boy Scout mom, the, the, the brownies at school. But at home, she was a different person. At home, there were things said that made me always feel like she just genuinely did not like me. She didn't like me as a person. I never felt like my mom even liked me. Um, yeah. Wow. And and that's that's a feeling that never changed. Yeah. Tell me, um, you said earlier that there were little things that, you know, you, what were those things that, you know, you saw, but am I? Maybe not. What, what were well, some of those things? Well, I, okay, I put it this way. There was one big thing. <laughs> there was one big thing. Um, 
living in a subdivision in the 70s is very much like that 70s show. There's a lot of stuff going on in a subdivision and in a subdivision of, of people who are coming from different backgrounds than you. Mm -hmm. So I was, I seen and was exposed to a lot of things that I probably would not have been exposed to. Like I babysat for a couple that were swingers. I didn't know that they were swinging. All okay. I knew that Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so went to Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so's house every night and we babysat all their kids. And, you know, so, you know, um, you know, and it's Ann Arbor. And, and so those type of things. Um, so when I would share things with my mother, because mm -hmm. she was my primary caretaker, um, it was never believed. I was always accused of um, snooping, of lying, of trying to maliciously destroy other people's lives. I know what you're capable of. That's what's in you. So I very, um, very early in my life, 10 to 12, developed the mindset that she does not think much of my character. Not that I even knew what the word character was. Mm -hmm. It was the feeling of my character. So I went above and beyond to be everything she accused me of. I made sure I was never any of those things. Mm -hmm. I never lied. I never stayed out late. I never went somewhere where I wasn't supposed to go. And and my over the top trying to please her, I really went through a lot of emotional and physical um, issues that were taking its toll. Um, really trying to be the perfect kid to get her to like me. Um, mm. So yes. I developed it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, I developed an eating disorder very early on. Mm. Um, bulimia that was is. a big thing. Um, I did not become bulimic out of, at, I'll put it this way, at the time, I didn't think it was an emotional issue. I thought it was, mommy keeps saying I'm chubby. Mommy keeps saying I'm fat. Mommy says I'm bigger than the other kids. I can't eat, but I'm hungry, but I don't want her to see me eat. So I was doing that. Mm. That was taking a physical toll on me. Um, so I was always How old were you problems. when you started doing that? Oh, about 11. Oh, really young. About 11. Yeah. Um, I had tried to take my life um, between 12 and 13. And subsequently around that time, um, I also was experiencing some sexual abuse by the hands of a neighbor whose father was a local pastor who my mother found very highly esteemed. And it was very clear when I told I mm -hmm. did tell that I was not going to be believed that I, I was enticing this, that I was encouraging this, that I was not going to destroy this family, that I was not believed. And subsequently, um, she called the police on me. She wanted to, to say what, what do you to, to scare me into not lying. The police questioning lineup was along the lines of, you can't make false reports. You can't make false allegations. This is going to ruin your family. Yeah. Everyone in the subdivision is going to know. And so I shut down. Yeah. And not verbally said the words, but in my heart of hearts that my dog just did something downstairs. Uh oh. <laughs> Um, and in my heart of hearts, I knew that was, that was what broke me. And she was no longer in my heart, my mom anymore. I, wow. I was, I knew at 13, it was up to me and it was up to God. Do you happen to know, did your brother experience those same types of feelings towards her or was their relationship different because it's a mommy no. son relationship? It, well, now, as, as I look back and I look for, um, for back to how we started, I was 18 months when my parents um, got me. Okay. And very quickly, they were, um, 
they had informed the adoption agency that they wanted a son. But there was that one year waiting period that you're supposed to have while you're still fostering. Well, my brother was born and um, was immediately uh, relinquished upon birth mm -hmm. and they needed an immediate placement for him. Mm -hmm. So within, in less than two months of me entering their home, there was a new baby boy. Oh, that's a lot. So my honeymoon period yeah, of sure. getting to know my parents and getting adjusted um, was taken over. And she very be quick, very um, quickly became obsessed with the new baby. The new baby. So, so my brother and I were raised as only children in the same household. We never interacted. We didn't really play with each other. We weren't taught to like each other. Um, in many ways, we were we were encouraged to stay away from each other. Um, even all through high school, there were going. We went to a relatively small high school, uh, mm -hmm. three hundred kids, oh, and small. only thir and only thirteen of them were black. There were students who never knew that he and I were brother and sister because we did not interact or engage with How, each other at what all. What does that look like in the house, especially when you have two children that are very close in age? It looks like a lot of rivalry, a lot mm. of competition, a lot of um, anger towards each other, a lot of hurt towards each other. Um, I was always with daddy. Yeah. Whenever, if, if I, and I would cry and I would grab onto his leg, if he could take me, I went. If it wasn't going to work, I went. And my brother was left at home with my mom. And I thought that that's where he wanted to be. And I thought that's who she wanted to be with. Yeah. And now as we're adults and we're closer now than we ever were before, I now know that that was not the not best the life for him. That was not the best life for him either. But, um. The, the the incident that occurred was my parents ran adult foster care homes and we we took care of um, developmentally disabled men. Mm -hmm. And so by this time we had moved um, to uh, a suburb of Ann Arbor and we had a huge country farm home, eight bedrooms, two kitchens, two would walk up one side of the house, walk down the other side of the house. Mm -hmm. And so the home was divided so that we had the care home where the residents lived and we had our family's home. Okay. Um, but all of the office supplies were in our part of the home. So I did, I acted very much like, you know, an employee, um, at a very young age at 15, 16. Um, and there was one day, if you've ever had a filing cabinet that, that the, the brackets are misplaced and you have to pull the tray all the way out yes. and take that bracket out to get everything back in. Well, um, there was a binder in there and it was misplaced and I pulled it out because I'm thinking it was for one of the consumers. And I needed to know whose it was and where it needed to go. Mm -hmm. It was not my intention to snoop or pry. Right. I was trying to put it back. Trying to put it back. Right? Um, yeah. So we took care of all men. So I opened up this binder and here's the name. Sharon, at that time, something. Did not clue in on it. Did not pay attention to it. I looked. I saw the name. It was a birth certificate and it was in the order of adoption. I did not know what an order of adoption was. All that was through my mind was, we have all men, so I don't know who this person is. So I don't mm -hmm. know where this goes. And so I brought it to my mom and uh -oh. I asked her, who, who is this? Where does this go? And I, when I say that I still hear the slap in my head, I hear I still feel the teeth hit. Yeah. When that when that hand contacted my jaw and it was such a violent slap that I didn't even feel pain. It was what just happened. Right, for what, sure. What did I do that I will never do again? I don't know what just happened. I don't know who this is. I'm not asking any questions. Whatever it is. It's bad. And, you know, she went through the, you know, you're snooping. You shouldn't be going through things that you shouldn't be going through. That's nothing. You don't have anything to do with that. Um, my brother 
had witnessed this. Yeah. And he immediately started joking that that's you. That's you. I knew they found you behind the garbage can. <laughs> I knew that I knew you were adopted. I, you know, because we were, we were always nah, 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 yeah, we yeah, yeah. nitpicky with so each that other. Was, so yeah, that, that was, was his excuse. For him. Yeah. Yes. That was his <laughs> excuse to, to finally put a label on it that he's the true son. And I was left at the garbage can. And so he went to school and told all of his friends, we found out my sister was adopted. Oh my God. And I was devastated. Yeah. You know, I, I you know, head hung, dodging people um, and didn't know how to answer it and didn't know how to handle it. So I put it in a, a emotional box, put the lid I on it. I ask you a question because you're very close to your dad. So when incidents would happen, were you able to at least talk to your dad? By that age, I had learned not to tell on mom. Got it. Because although my father was very comforting and very encouraging, and he always encouraged me to talk to him, and he always, baby girl, whatever you need, you can always talk to me. Mm -hmm. And he would actually say things like, well, your mom, you know, your mom has some issues, or your mom's under stress, or your mom's, you know, she really does love you. This is, this is the, she's doing the best she can. And although he would say those words and they were supposed to have been words of comfort, they also were words that were going, hmm. Well, okay. Well, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's why, going on? What's why really does, happening? Why does, yeah, why yeah. does daddy have to, why does he have to sugarcoat mom's behavior so much? Um, so, and, and if she thought that I had told something, it, it was, it would have just been worse. Um when I saw the, the movie Mommy Dearest, <laughs> when that movie came out, there was such a deep sense of relief knowing that there was somebody else out there like me. Mm. There was somebody else that had been told the words, you treat me like a common dog on the street. Yeah. That there was that. somebody else out there that had she said, ben. why do you um, want to embarrass me? Yes. And yeah. It was all yes. about her. Yeah. Oh my, that whole line. I just sat there going amazing. Yeah. That scene in the closet with all of her clothes being <laughs> strewn. Up. Every time I see a wire hanger, I think about those scenes. <laughs> I, I could recite. I watched that movie me so too. many times. I did too. Because it was me. Christina Crawford was me. Wow. And I think that was the Do you know first... how powerful that is? If for anybody that doesn't know, go the, the movie Mommy Dears. Yes. It's the name of a movie. Yeah. And I had and I like and I did like a, a mental book report trying to figure out, oh, she's adopted. And then I was like, oh, oh. hmm, okay. But never was I gonna question. I was not going to question them. They said I was not. They had their story, they had their journey, they had their testimony, and I was not going oh, to question this. You don't, I don't right. question my parents. Um, Let me ask you so, a question. Um, is that a, do you think that's a, because they felt disrespected, your mother, if you question me, you're being disrespectful. I think it's a combination of a couple of things. First of all, it was the time. You know, yeah. it was children should be, sh children should speak when they're spoken to. Yeah. Children should stay out of grown folks business. Yeah. Um, children should be out of sight, you know. Um, so there was that aspect, which is very much a, a, um, a black family umbrella. You know, we all heard that. Yeah. And then there was also the Catholic school guilty. Everything is a sin. Everything is a guilt and you need penance and everything you do, you've got to bear your soul, expose yourself and purge yourself of these sins or you're going to hell. Everything you do, you're going to hell. Listen, I need to know as you grow up, did you go to college? Did you leave the house and go to college? Is that the route that you took? And once, if that's the route that you took and you left from under um, their roof, how are you managing the world? Now that you're mm. outside of this world. Okay. So, um, yes, I, I completed high school and it was my intention to go to Michigan State University. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I had no assistance with applying for school or things like that. It was something that was not even in their mindset to assist me with. So I did the best that I could and didn't get some things right. So subsequently I wasn't able to start at MSU when I wanted to. Okay. Um, So my parents encouraged me to go to the community college um, because I could get a Pell Grant. You could go without costs and and everything was about costs. And my parents made sure that I knew what everything cost. You Mm -hmm. know, we've just sent you to these private schools. Now you're on your own. So, um, so I went to um, Jackson Community College first and that, that year I was still living at home. So that year didn't feel very much different than high school. I was still with the same community people. I was still seeing people that a good majority of them had gone to either my school or the local school. And I knew them um, through friend sets. And so it was very comfortable. um, And it was very much playtime. First year in school Mm -hmm. was (laughs) playtime. I think we spent more time majoring in spades than we did class. Oh my gosh. Yes. (laughs) Okay, we were skipping classes because the Uno game was thick. Yes, I listen. Yes, freshman year is always yes. Yeah, my my okay. transcripts from my freshman year. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and I had joined the Black Students Co- um, Coalition, so I was with more African American students than I'd ever been with in my life. Mm. So I was I was in. I oh. was the girl. I was living my best life. Not really going to class. You're not going to class at all. Life. No, no. Um, But I also had that fear factor. My parents are going to kill me. When they see my grades. Yes, yes. Um, So I would drop out of classes and proctor classes so that I wouldn't have report cards when I go to school every day. Um, But I knew that that couldn't last. So once I had done my um, my basic classes, my one-on-one classes, and I was able to go to Michigan State the next year, Um, My first year in school at Jackson College, I had met my husband. I I had met a man um, who was a little bit older, um, and he uh, he was six years older, so he was 24. I'm 18, Mm. and so and he and he's very much an old soul. So he was the one that was saying, "Oh no, you're not going to you're not going to stay here with these chicken heads in school. You need to get going. You need to go." and you know, and at the same time, my parents are not saying anything about how I'm going to pay for MSU. You know, you know, I think I'm applying for um, grants. I'm applying for loans. I'm I'm applying for work studies. Yeah. And um, and it very quickly became uh, my husband became a person in my life that he's like, um, no, I'm going to invest in you. And and before we were married, it was a conscious investment in me. And I'd never had anybody invest in me. So he was, no, you're going to school. No, you're going to do this. No, you're not hanging with this crew. No, I'm, I'm calling you every day. You're going to be in school. So if I have to be up there, you're going to be in school. Your parents are, they just know you enrolled, but they, they're not questioning how is this getting paid for? My my parents moved me up there. They paid for my I. Um, I was dual enrolled. I Mm -hmm. went to the Lansing Community College in MSU because I went into a corrections program that had a pilot program that merged both schools. So I was able to live off campus, but living off campus means you have rent and an apartment. Um, Luckily, a a high school classmate of mine had already acquired the apartment and she was looking for roommates. So my parents did move me up there. They did pay for the first month's rent. they paid for the first semester of tuition and that was that was it that was it okay and <laughs> and let me let me say they never said that they wouldn't pay but they never offered or said you know where's your bill where's your tuition how much is tuition what classes are you yeah. taking they never said those things so here i go that girl who does not want to make waves who does not want to ripple feathers because y'all really don't like me a whole lot anyway yeah. Yeah, and yeah. i figured that their investment in me is over by this point um they just never i i, I worked myself through and my husband literally was helping me pay for college before we were ever married. Oh, um, wow. But my 
I, I consider that my first year of school because that's, that's really when I buckled down. And yes, I did not handle life that year. Um, I really had a serious breakdown. Um, I had a serious um, acknowledgement of I didn't know who I was as a person. I didn't know who I wanted to be. I had never had those talks with my parents. Hmm. You know, I have have five children now, so I'm constantly, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be today? (laughs) Right, right, right. What do you want to be now? How will we get there? What is your journey? And my parents never... I felt like they never really had time to discuss that because they were always running their business. And I think it's your statement of, I didn't know me. Uh, How many adoptees feel like that? Like you get out in this world and you're like, okay, who am I? Regardless if you know or not. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but that sense of, oh my God, who is this? Well, and I felt like I knew even less than most other young people because I had these, I had these feelings like there's something wrong with my story. Um, and you like probably I, knew even less too because of how you were raised. Mm-hmm, exactly. Exactly. I knew how to conform to my parents' um, ideals of me. Right. I did not ho- know how to be my own individual my person own individual in the life. Right. Where people right. were now judging yeah. me as an adult. Right. Because they don't know. Mm-hmm. that wasn't right. at the house right. we just see you yes as you um, are today so I went to school and I went to bed I went to school and bed school and bed I get up in the morning I go to class and luckily God placed in my life a professor of my psych class that was also a counselor who just saw me just saw it and, you know, it, it was back that, that lean on me type of thing in school where the professor would, you know, ask you to hang around after school and just really ask you, well, what's going on? Well, you know, what are you taking? Well, why did you decide that? You know, um, and coincidentally, I, I started school in veterinary med because I had figured out that I could get a scholarship being a black female who was raised in the country to go into veterinary med okay. because that's not an area that black females go mm, into. <laughs> so I had a scholarship to go into veterinary med. Okay. Um, and I had figured that out. And my, um, our local veterinarian who took care of our farm animals um, had proctored me and had signed off and he was my mentor. So, so I, so school was being paid for. And I was going to school because I had to keep grades up for that scholarship. Right. But I was coming home and getting in the oh, bed. Depressed. That was it. That was my that was life. Yeah. I didn't go. I I did not attend school functions. I didn't. I never. I never went to an MSU football game. I never went to an MSU wow. basketball game. Um, I never went to any of the campus parties. I'd hear about them. I'd see them. I'd mm. hear the after stories and everything. I did not want just, people I I didn't want people to see me hmm. I'm gonna I look. didn't want people to discover the real me and the real me didn't know who she was who she was so how do we get to the point where you begin to unravel your story well um by my second year of college um my husband and I had we had decided to get married, and, and which is no no it was no big romantic story. It was one of those you're my best friend, I'm your best friend. Do you want to date anymore? Nope, I don't want to date anymore. Do you want to? Nope, I'm satisfied with you. We will be best friends forever, and best friends will make the best husband and wife. You want to get married? Sure. You want to get married? Sure. Okay, here's the date. <laughs> and there it is. So okay, <laughs> so we formed a partnership. Okay. Because this little, this, this person that's a little bit older than me, who is business minded, who is a military brat, who has an awesome family foundation mm-hmm. and who has an amazing father and an amazing mother was just guiding me through life. And so we, we got married, we had our daughter, um, and I was going through life. My mother 
um, never, it, it never occurred to her to assist with the wedding or say, you know, it was, that was never a conversation I was that I ever had with my just mom. getting ready to ask you. Never a conversation. That. You know, I, oh my God, I had my daughter's wedding planned when she was 12. <laughs> my mother never, ever discussed a what, wedding. Did she with attend me. at least? Was she there? No, um, so here's the story of that. Uh-oh. We had a wedding planned and unfortunately my father-in-law passed away. We were, we were expecting to get married February 14th of 86. Mm-hmm. My father-in-law passed away February 11th oh, okay. and we canceled the wedding because it just wasn't appropriate to do that. And, um, I soon after found out that I was pregnant and I was like, okay, I'm not walking down the aisle with a baby bump. And so we waited until after my daughter was born, um, to get married. So then I had shamed my mother. So then I was not, she was not paying for a wedding. Um, I didn't deserve a wedding. Um, you're, you've already, you're already shacking up. You've already had a baby. You've already done this and that. So y'all go ahead and do what you want to do. So, um, we got married at the courthouse. And we still invited lots of friends and family. And of course, I wanted my father there. Mm-hmm. And we were there. It was a snowstorm that day. People were sliding off the roads to get there. It was dangerous. But I was like, we're not turning back. We're doing this today. And we got there. And I'm waiting. And our time slot was passing away. You know, at the courthouse, yeah, you got yeah. a time, slot. time slot. You right. get married at, they said two o'clock. <laughs> right, right. And my dad was not there. So I was worrying, you know, did something happen? Did the, you know, were the roads too treacherous? And my mom showed up. And I was so disappointed. I don't want to say she was the last person I wanted to see there, but she was the last person I wanted to see there. And I was so disappointed that my dad wasn't there. And I asked her, you know, where's daddy? He had to work. My parents had employees. They went everywhere that they wanted to go. You did not schedule staff on this day. Okay. Oh. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So at what point did so you get married and you have your kids? When do you, because I know you just found out just recently, but what was, what changed in the air that well, made you say, okay? Um, when my and daughter let me was ask born. You this too. Hold on. I have a second yeah. to, part two to that question. Were both of your parents already gone by the time you got your answers? No. Girl, no. do tell. Okay. <laughs> Um, so my mother never, never came to the birth of my children. It was, that was not important. Um, she showed up for my daughters. Um, she came with my husband to pick me up. Um, my daughter was jaundiced. So she stayed a few extra days. Mm -hmm. So she did come like on day four to pick us up and she did bond with my daughter incredibly. She loved, she loved that baby girl. And I was thinking, yes. This is what's going to bring us together. This is the piece that are going to finally make us mother and daughter. And we will finally have three generations. And actually my grandmother lived with my mom. We will have four Four generations generations. that my daughter will be able to grow up with and and see. And my mom was awesome with my daughter. Um, And then it took six years to have my son. And I was thinking, she'll be awesome with this grandchild also. She only has one, and here's number two. You know, Mm -hmm. my parents are up in age. They're in their 70s at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Nope, she didn't show up for his birth at all. And he never, daddy loved him to death because that's his little boy. That's That's his little man. That's tractors and and horses and and pony rides and all that. Mom just was like, you know, yeah, you can come pick him up. I'll take I'll take the other one. Um, so that bothered me, and it yeah. bothered my son, and he was raised being bothered by it. And she set a different set of rules and standards for him. Um, as we were growing up, um, she just she just didn't treat him as, as nicely, or showered him with the love and attention that she did my daughter. Um, and my son felt that. And yeah. I felt that for him. Um, and it, and it always bothered me. My father 
passed away in 99, mm -hmm. which was devastating to me. Um, and we, we lived, you know, we, we had our own home. We lived in the city. She still lived out in the country. But once again, Catholic school girl kicked in, dutiful daughter kicked in, and we packed up our house and we moved back to the home that I grew up in. My mom mm -hmm. had a small bungalow house next door by then. Mm -hmm. She had retired. The care home was no longer operating. And we had this huge, big country farmhouse that had all the space in the world for my kids. And we moved back because I thought mom needed us. I thought she would be different because she needed us. And hmm. that was, that was 10 wasted years that we, we stayed 10 years as, as her next door neighbor. Um, we might as well. Been it, it, it was a reality, or excuse me, a fairy tale that you had put in your head that you yeah. do this because she, and yes. it's going to be different. And yes. And then I, it was I none thought, of that. It was none of that. I yeah. thought out of her grief, she would soften. I thought having her grandchildren, watching them play in the yard, and that she would soften. Um, and actually, it, it became even worse. Because um, like I mentioned that my father named everything, you know, this, you know, if, if he bought a new tool and it was expensive tool, he'd call my husband. So I just bought this and I paid this for it. And I want you to make sure you hang on to this. You know, don't let your mother, don't let your mother-in-law sell it because she has no idea the value of it. Okay. <laughs> when my father passed away, before we had moved there, my mom had a barn sale and sold all my father's belongings with, at, without ever telling us. And sold it for pennies on the dollar because she had no concept of what, what my father was a, was a journeyman. My father was a master electrician. My mm. father was a, was a general contractor and a builder. So we had a pole barn full of supplies. If you wanted to be a plumber, he had the whole plumber's kit. If you wanted to be an electrician, he had the whole electrician's kit. And my husband was, you know, like, oh, you know, I have every tool I... Yeah, we, we happened to come out there and she's having a barn sale. I didn't get even a tie tack that belonged to my dad. Um, my husband got a test tool that basically, I have to say, he stole out of a garage sale because that we got there late. And he's like, oh, my God, you know, you're, this means something to me and this means something to your dad. I'm taking it. And I said, take it. Right. Go ahead and take it. Um, my brother, he got a couple of hunting jackets and, and he got a couple of rifles, but that's, yeah, there was no regard to what we had thought and what we had been raised to be our legacy. Yeah. Um, her story was that, well, it's all mine. It's mine to do with what I want. You don't deserve it. Why would I give it to you? What? We earned it. We worked for it. It's ours. So being constantly told once again, as a, as a mature woman yeah. who has your grandchildren, that I did not deserve any of these things, hit home very hard. Um, we had 40 acres. We grew up walking that land, picturing where we were going to build our houses and how much land daddy was giving me, how much land daddy was giving my brother. And all of that was taken away because we didn't deserve it in her eyes. We hadn't, it, we weren't do it in her eyes. Um, and finally we, we said, okay, we have ruined our children's childhood by making them stay out here in the country and doing, I'll put it this way. When my son graduated, you know, country kids, we have bonfires. Yeah. Okay. So classmates everywhere. There was probably 75, 80 kids out there having an amazing bonfire. And we had his late in the summer. So it's 4th of July. We're doing fireworks. The mm -hmm. kids are having a ball. They're having a ball. Um, 10 o'clock came. My mother decided it was time to shut the party down. And she called the police and the fire department. Oh, girl. <laughs> Cleared everybody out. Everybody go home. Party is over. So you know what? It was still it was going on in my head though. As you're telling these stories, and then, but that incident when you found that paper is still in the back of my mind. So it had to be in the back of your mind. It was not. 
It wasn't? It was not. They said, they said they're my mom. mom. They said, they said you're right. I'm your dad. You're I right. knew my entire life that mom was different, that mom had some emotional issues, that mom was maybe bipolar, that mom was maybe, I'm even bordering on, I had thought maybe she was schizophrenic. I'm like, because you see things and hear things that I didn't do or say. I had all these things in my head that mm. mom has problems, but she's my mom. And I just have to deal with these problems. I have to live this life because she is my mom. Never, ever again did I ever question that document. I never forgot it, but it wasn't me. It was a name on a piece of paper. It was never me. So as I'm growing, as I'm getting older and life is taking over and, and you become more mature and, and, you know, you have medical appointments and things start to hurt that never hurt before and right. things like that. <laughs> um, and Perry now, Paul shows up. Yeah. Problems. Well, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and so, all, like I said, all of my first cousins, they're now up in age. Right, because they're, they're so much you know, older. They're right? all, yeah, they're all 50s and 60s and, and even older. And a lot, and cancer is happening to so many of them. Mm -hmm. And ovarian cancer and utero, um, utero cancer and fibroids and all of these different things. And I did suffer with fibroids and breast cancers and lymph noids and all of these different things so as i'm hearing cousin after cousin after cousin have all of these problems and i start to tell my doctor and i start to check different boxes when you do your family history because of, you know my 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 grandmother had this and my auntie had this and yes and and you and you're doing all of the check boxes um and and it, it turned out that was at the time where Angelina had that breast reduction because she was predispositioned to having breast cancer. And so it was a big, huge thing that. that she had had the mastectomy to prevent having breast cancer. And I brought that up to my doctor. I am predispositioned to so many things. What do you think about that? And he readily agreed. Of course, you've got so many genetic markers and so many doctor consults and so many family members that have these things. You know, I brought it up. And I made the decision, you know, I don't want I don't want to die early. I don't want to leave my kids. I want to live a long healthy life and what can I do to do that? Um, I'll do whatever I need to do to prolong my life. I, I, was, I adored my kids. I was never going to treat my kids like mom and dad treated me. So I wanted mm -hmm. to be here forever. Um, and because it was an elective surgery, I was able to um, kind of finagle the medical procedure so that it was a, um, so I ended up having a breast reduction with a unilateral um, mastectomy to have those side that had had a um, tumor in it removed and then have it, have it reconstructed. So I was getting the best of both worlds. Not only were I getting my 42 Fs reduced, <laughs> was preventing breast cancer Off because- Family medical history that wasn't even yours. It was that day. It was that day because I had checked those boxes. You had checked. I had those been checking boxes. those boxes. I had been checking those boxes since before my daughter was born. And was your mom still here when you had this surgery? Yes, she was. So she's aware. <laughs> yes, she what, was. In what your my determining mom factors was were. aware of a good majority of my medical history. Um, one of the things that when I was in grade school, I, I used to go to therapy um, after school. And um, because we didn't qualify for um, free therapy and everything, my parents paid for this. They paid for these therapy sessions. In these therapy sessions, I would talk about separation anxiety. I would talk about being afraid to leave my parents. I would talk about not measuring up to my parents. I would talk about disappointing my parents. I would talk about um, having dreams that I was being taken or left 
or abandoned. I had those dreams and I had those dreams uh, on a regular basis Wow! to the point that they were night terrors. And I had night terrors throughout my adult history. My mother paid for these. My parents sat in waiting room I while I had these therapy sessions. Just mind boggled at the amount of things. And now you're talking about medical things. Mm -hmm. And still nobody said. Yes. Anything. My mother, my mother knew that I was having this breast reduction and um, this, this unilateral removal. Um, she knew she didn't come. Oh, she no, wasn't no, there no. to support me, no, no. but she knew that I was having it right. and she knew why I was having it. Um, still nothing. No, no. Um, if there so, was ever a time to say something, that was it. That was the time <laughs> before, before you go and have these surgeries. There's something you need to know. Yeah. You have to tell me how, how did you find out? Well, we're advanced forward and I had two birth children. My, my, my husband had a son already. So my first baby was my stepson. Mm -hmm. He was two when I married his husband, my, my husband. Then we had our daughter. And then six years later, we had my son. There was something that I always did. When I was a little girl, I always adopted dollies. <laughs> strangest, strangest little phenomenon playing. I'd have all my blue, I'd have all my little black babies. I'd sit them at the table. I'd play tea parties. And then I would get my white baby dolls and bring them in and they would be their sister. And I would say, yes, you're white, but you're sisters. And in my subconscious child mind, I was always adopting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as growing up, it was something that I had casually mentioned to my husband. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like to adopt one day. I'd like to add a child to our amazing life. Because I thought I was super mom. I thought I was doing everything right and perfect. So we wanted to bring another child into this. And so okay. we adopted a little girl. Um, and subsequently, she came as a package deal because little did we know she had a brother. And before her adoption was final, we were um, approached about adopting the sibling pair. We had already had her two years. We were not willing to lose her. And so we adopted both children. And he basically came to a sight unseen. Within 24 hours, he was on our doorsteps. He was 10. She was two. So I ended up adopting a daughter the same age and age frame as I was. Mm -hmm. Did not know that. Mm -hmm. Had no clue about that. So... I'm raising a toddler, a two-year-old, and now we have a 10-year-old who has a lot of issues, a lot of trauma in his life because mm -hmm. he was raised with his mother. He had seen his father murdered. He had seen a lot of things that I was not mm -hmm. equipped to deal with. And that adoption was not going well because he was running away back to mom more than staying with us. Mm -hmm. So we were dealing with that. My mother was very critical of the whole process. Um, she, she did not. Wait a minute. She... she she objected to us adopting. Not she thought it was ludicrous. We didn't need to do that. She made us feel like it was the dumbest idea in the world to be adopting two children. I feel like uh -uh. she... Uh -uh. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go, go figure. Um... You need a pie with the good good? Oh yeah, what's the one? Adoption. 